All right, good evening, everyone. Looks like we've got some folks uh, coming on to the webinar, so we'll give it another minute or two here and then we'll get started. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to our monthly webinar. My name is Justin Cooper. I'm a hard money lender and a full time real estate investor. Each month we bring in some of our friends in the industry to share their expertise. This may be through a presentation like when we talk about self directed IRAs or title insurance, or we may simply interview our expert friends and dive deep into how they got started, where their investing has taken them and what they see coming both for themselves and for the industry. Now, I also want to say thank you to everyone who made it onto tonight's event. We know that you're giving up some of your precious time, so Joe and I will do everything we can to bring you the value that you're hoping for. And tonight should be easy as we're talking about an always relevant topic, analyzing deals. This webinar is brought to you by Pine Financial Group. Pine Financial is Colorado and Minnesota's premier hard money lender. Pine focuses on the needs of Colorado and Minnesota real estate investors. We are investors ourselves, and we know what it takes to get deals closed. Everyone at Pine Financial Group is dedicated to the success of its clients. We only experience success when our clients are succeeding. So we have a habit of telling you when a deal should or should not be done. And isn't that what you want from a professional in the industry, especially someone that you trust as an advisor? You will benefit from our honesty and integrity when you choose to work with us. Now tonight's webinar is very important because we're talking about analyzing deals. Now, Joe will be sharing his spreadsheet that helps quickly and accurately analyze rental properties, which he created to help investors find the right deal for their portfolio. We'll learn how easy the spreadsheet is to use and how powerful it is for your real estate investing. We'll walk through the spreadsheet line by line and Joe and I will answer all your questions. Now, Joe, can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself before we dive into tonight's topic? Yes, happy to. Can you hear me okay, Justin? Absolutely. All right, great. Well, hey, my name is Joe Massey. I'm with Castle and Cook Mortgage, and I've got all of my information here on the screen. And Justin, are you able to see my screen okay? I sure can. Perfect. Well, let me just bring my bio over. Um, I know this is kind of small type, but I'll just kind of give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I actually attended the Colorado School of Mines and graduated from there uh, with a degree in economics and business. And I've been in lending since 2002. And really started, I did two years in commercial lending and then started in residential lending in 2004. And uh, like my staff likes to tell me all the time, that makes me pretty much a dinosaur because a lot of loan officers are in and out of this industry um, pretty quickly. The average lifespan of a loan officer in residential lending is about three years. Um, so my team likes to joke with me that I'm a dinosaur. And, uh, you know, I still use things like uh, a dial up telephone and a dial up modem and stuff. But I think it's been kind of fun uh, because I've been doing this a long time and hopefully have a lot of experience and, and some ideas that I can share with you, Justin, and with everybody here on the webinar. Um, what I focus on is helping people generate long-term wealth through investment properties. Um, I'd say a very big niche of our business is working with investors, working with hard money lenders like Pine Financial, um, finding deals that are good out in the market, helping you analyze those deals, and then of course we provide financing for those particular transactions. Um, so if you have questions for me, um, please type them in the chat box as we're going along. Um, Justin's gonna kind of moderate that as we're discussing the spreadsheet here. Um, so if you have questions, please don't feel don't hesitate to ask that question because if you're thinking of it, somebody else probably is as well. And then after the webinar, of course, you can always email me at jmassey at castlecookmortgage.com. You can call me at 303 
809-709-7769. And then I'm going to put Justin's information back up here as well. Uh, Justin at pinefinancialgroup.com and his phone number 303-835-4445. So guys, Perfect. let's thanks. Let's, uh, before, yeah. before we dive in though, you said if people have questions to put into the chat box, the crazy thing about the webinar is there's actually a chat box and a questions box. So I will not be monitoring the chat. Uh, drop your oh. questions into the questions section. There's already been a couple. Uh, specifically, will the will a copy of the presentation be available for download? Yes, we're recording it. We're going to post it onto YouTube. Um, and will the spreadsheet be available? And yes, we're going to be emailing it to uh, to all the attendees. All right, Joe. Thanks. Back Perfect. To you. Yes, you know what? There's another great point. I don't even know how webinars work. I didn't, didn't know there was a chat box and a question box. So again, if it wasn't for you, Justin, I would be sending this out, this webinar out via smoke signal. So I appreciate your help. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So let's let's jump in and, and talk a little bit about um, our investment property analysis sheet. Um, now, Justin, I'm going to keep checking on this because I know sometimes um, webinars can move a little slowly. Are you able to view uh, the investment property spreadsheet that I just pulled over onto the screen? Yep, we got it. All right, great. So what this is, this is going to be available to everybody that's on the webinar. We're going to email it out to you uh, if you're on the webinar live. And if you're listening to the recorded version, you can get this uh, by emailing me at jmassey at castlecookmortgage.com, or you can get it by emailing Justin uh, at justin at pinefinancialgroup.com. So what we're going to do is we're going to start at the top, and we're just going to follow these instructions. Work your way down the sheet and putting the appropriate information into each yellow cell. So what that's going to tell you is only the areas highlighted in yellow are the ones that you're going to be able to change. You can't make changes over here. You can't change any of the formulas. Um, and I really like this format because it really prevents you from kind of getting into too much trouble. Um, and what I mean by that is I've seen people with analysis spreadsheets that they'll put in information and then they kind of don't like the result so they'll just physically change the result well that's not the purpose of this you don't want to just put in two or three numbers and say oh my gosh it's a 15 cap you want to put in the real numbers and then the sheet's going to tell you what's your cap rate all right so that's an important distinction is you can't break it you can make all the changes you want and it's not going to tear up the formulas um, you want to make sure that you're selecting the correct number of units. Um, that's something we're going to talk about right here. This is for one to four unit properties. And certain lines have comments that you can put in additional information. And once you have filled out everything on this first tab here in the inputs tab, you're going to go to the cash purchase, financing purchase, and hard money purchase, and then the summary page, and we're going to see our results. Um, so let's just go through one just as a quick sample. And then, Justin, I, I believe you had one of these transactions recently on Asbury Street that we can review. Is that right? I do. I did. Uh, I don't have any of the info right there in front of me, but uh, I know we've talked about it and gone through the sheet before. So uh, yeah. if you have any of that stuff available or I can try and shoot some stuff off the top of my head, I mean, uh, yeah. it should be somewhat fresh. I only bought it last month. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me go through a sample scenario, then we'll look at that one together. And uh, viewers out there, if you have comments, again, please go ahead and put those in the question box. So we're going to start right here. And we're going to talk. Put, we're going to input the property address. Let's just say I'm buying uh, one two three Main Street. It's one of my favorite addresses. Um, and let's just say it's a single family. Uh, but again, we could do duplex, triplex, or fourplex. Um, purchase price. Let's just select a, a purchase price of. Uh, $200,000. And let's say this property needs some work. Um, now, Justin, can you comment just for a second on, you know, the properties that you specialize in and the types of hard money lending that you do and sort of what that process is and why it's important to have something be repaired? Yeah. So most of what we do at Pine Financial, we are hard money lenders. And most of what we do is uh, fund fix and flips. Now, we also fund rental properties like we're going to talk about tonight uh, and new construction projects. But basically, they're Anything that we would be associated with would be a value add um, type of deal. So, you know, if you just look at a generic fix and flip, you're going to buy for one price, you're going to fix it up, and then through those repairs, you're going to hopefully exponentially increase the value of the property. We're not looking for a dollar, dollar, dollar to dollar return uh, on that investment, saying if you put a $25,000 budget, uh, the value of the property will go up by 25. We're talking about putting $25,000 worth of work into it. And then the value goes up by 50, 75, $100,000. So through doing that, we're increasing the, the equity in the property. Uh, and if you're doing a fix and flip, of course, you can sell it and capture that uh, found equity uh, as profit. But what we're going to talk about here is using that uh, new equity to qualify for a refinance in the loan. 
So Joe, you brought up a slide here from a different presentation we've done together. Uh, so yeah, a quick overview of the process, you would locate the property, right? That's what real estate agents and wholesalers help us do. We get the property under contract. Uh, and number two, we get it under contract and put together the repair budget. Uh, actually going through and putting together the full budget. Maybe you did that you know, before you put it under contract, but actually pencil the paper. Uh, we'll analyze the deal in, Which in is a what way. we're talking about today, right here. Exactly. The analytics, right, sorry, exactly. go ahead. <laughs> so then uh, once you do that, you confirm it, the budget makes sense, the deal is as good as you want it to be. Then you go ahead and get the hard money loan where you actually buy the property in step three. Now, once you uh, own the property, you have a hard money loan that paid for the uh, purchase, and hopefully uh, the hard money lender is giving you the repair money. Now you're down to step four. You're actually in the property repairing it. Once it's all fixed up and beautiful, you're going to place a tenant. And then number six, you're going to be refinancing out of that short-term hard money loan into a loan similar to what Joe's going to talk about, uh, Joe being the conventional lender. And that's where you're going to have your 30-year loan, something like that, where you're really off to the races, cash flow, and building the real wealth that will come from owning rental properties. Perfect. Well, th thanks for that, Justin. I think it's important to really kind of understand what we're looking to do here. We're looking to buy a property that needs a little bit of work. We're going to fix it up. And then we're going to have some value in that property after fixing it up. So I really liked your numbers that you gave there. Let's just say we're putting $25,000 into a property. And, you know, one that I saw recently, um, one of my investors put $25,000 into that property. And he got about $65,000 of equity return. So in this particular case, we're paying $200, putting in $25. And after repair value for that example was $265. Now, again, some of these numbers, um, are going to work. Some of these aren't going to work, which is why we're going to do this uh, through our spreadsheet to see if this is a good deal or not. Now, Justin, uh, hard money loan to cost. Um, if it costs me two hundred thousand and it costs me twenty five thousand to repair this property, will you lend a hundred percent as a hard money lender, one hundred percent of the cost uh, to purchase and rehab that property? Potentially, yes. If the deal is strong enough, we can go up to a hundred percent loan to cost. That's right. Now, and you stop, though, if there's not enough uh, ARV or uh, fixed up equity in the property, you stop at 70%. Is that right? Yeah, correct. So we'll lend 100% of your costs up to 70% of the after repair value. Yep. And that's built into the spreadsheet here. So we have hard money loan to cost and you can change that. Uh, every hard money lender is different. Maybe they only lend a 90% or 85. Um, Pine Financial is who we built the spreadsheet with. They'll lend up to 100% loan to cost with a maximum of 70% ARV. And so that fills in automatically over here in the gray section. So you can't change that, uh, but you can put, you know, maybe they're only going to lend you 90% loan to cost or, you know, 75 loan to cost, et cetera. Let's say it's 100% loan to cost. And Justin, tell me about interest rate and points. What do you guys charge for that? Yeah, so the interest rate uh, in Colorado and Minnesota, we are at 12.9% interest. Oh, wow. Okay, great. You guys have rates have gone down then. We did. We did. We uh, we put our heads together and did uh, some things to get more, uh, well, well, to try and raise our, our capital a little uh a little cheaper, I guess. So then, sure. then of course, we can pass those savings on to our clients. That's great. So I'm going to put in 12.9. Um, the spreadsheet will default to where it shows 13 here, but you can see up here it does have 12.9. Uh, it just only goes out to zero decimal places. And then what about points? What do you, what do you charge for upfront points, Justin? Yeah, so it depends on the size of the deal. It uh, never more than four points. So let's leave it there as four points right now. But uh, you know, depending okay. on folks, uh, the size of the deal and the size of the loan, definitely give us a call. We might be able to do a little bit better than that. Okay, great. Now here's an important one. Um, how long until we're going to do the refinance? Now this is going to vary widely depending on how much renovation you're putting into this property. Um, Twenty-five thousand dollars. I think you should be able to do that renovation between two and three months. Um, you know, some folks that are on this call are really skilled uh, contractors, and they could probably burn through to a twenty-five thousand dollars rehab in a month. Uh, myself, personally, I don't do rehabs. It would probably take me six months, and everyone would be mad. Uh, but that's why I'm the numbers guy. So let's just estimate three months. But if you've got a larger budget, smaller budget, you can adjust these months uh, based on your skill level, how quickly it'll take you to get through the process. But you know, you could change it to four months, five months. Let's just say for this scenario, three months. 
uh, interest rates, you know, interest rates, um, unlike Justin on uh, his rates have been going down on 30 year loans, rates have actually been increasing lately. Um, so for most conventional 30 year fixed rate investment properties, you're going to be between five and five and a quarter right now. So let's use worst case scenario, 5.25. And then the term of the loan, let's just say 30 years. We can select 15 years or 20 years if we want, uh, but let's just say we're going to do a 30-year loan. And then down payment percentage. Um, Justin, you, you know the answer to this, but what's the what do most investors think is the minimum down payment to purchase an investment property with a conventional loan? Yeah, the, most people think it's 20 to 25%. That's exactly right. Most people think it's 20 to 25. It's actually only 15%. So it's one little plug on something that we do a little different here at Castle & Cook Mortgage. Um, number one, we do a lot of work with folks like Justin and hard money lenders like Justin uh, to help you purchase with a lot less than 10 or 15 or 20% down. But we also have a traditional plan where you can do as little as 15% down. But to make the math easy today, let's say we're going to do 25% down. Now, acquisition costs. This is when you buy a property. Oh, excuse me, I skipped a section here. Uh, as we're going through the monthly payment, your hard money costs, your mortgage costs, your mortgage monthly closing costs, uh, and your refinance interest rate are all going to automatically populate. Okay. The reason being is the rate on a purchase loan is always a little bit less than the rate on a refinance loan. And so these numbers are going to be important as we get into the analysis. So some of the things over here in the gray section, you're not going to be able to change. But over here in the yellow section is what you'll need to edit. Now, when you buy a property, Justin, I understand we've got some points, just like if you're getting a loan from me, you might have some closing costs. But outside of points and processing costs, are there other costs associated with acquiring a property? I, I say yes, but uh, Justin, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, if you're going to get a loan, then that lender will want an appraisal on the property to confirm, you know, the value. Uh, you may or may not be required, or you may or may not want to get a home inspection. That's right, inspection, title work. If you highlight this little red indicator over here, it's going to give you samples of what to watch out for: property insurance, inspection, appraisal, transfer taxes, title insurance. This is all the stuff associated with buying a property. Even if you pay cash for a property, you're going to have some closing costs. All right, and that's what you want to plug in here: that you can adjust these closing costs up or down uh, depending on what you think they're going to be. Let's just say um, two hundred thousand dollar home, probably about twenty two hundred dollars. That would cover appraisal, inspection, title insurance, transfer taxes, etc. Uh, Joe, before we dive into that next section there, uh, up one section in the mortgage term, we put in 30, but there's a question, how do we decide if we want a 15-year or a 30-year loan? Which is better? That's a great question. You know, I think it comes down to your personal preference. I have some of my clients that prefer 15-year, and they don't get a lot of cash flow. Really, all of the rent that they're getting from that property, they're putting right back into the principal, and that property is paying down very rapidly, and they're going to have it paid off in 15 years. I have other clients that only get 30-year loans, and they understand it's going to take a long time to pay off the property. In fact, they may never pay it off depending on their plans, um, but what they're looking for is monthly cash flow. So I think that's a terrific question, and that's something that we can analyze as we get into this, and I think it comes down to what are your goals with the property? Um, do you want cash flow, or do you want it to be paid off? Maybe you're going to be retiring 16 years from now. You want it to be paid off in 15 years, great, let's put it on a 15-year loan because you don't need that cash flow until you reach retirement age. So terrific question. Um, and that's definitely something that that each is going to be individual for each investor. Yeah. And I think that, uh, I mean, as we're working our way through this spreadsheet here, I think it's something just kind of set the expectation that, you know, when we get to the bottom of this page or, you know, one of the other tabs, there's not going to be a red light, green light scenario where, yes, you should buy this. No, you should not buy this uh, because it's not, an easy question to answer in something so generic, you know, where we have a webinar where there's a hundred people on the call, there's going to be a hundred different opinions of whether or not they should buy this property based on what we're plugging into it. So uh, it's, all of this is a very personal um, uh, decision as to what is a good deal for me and what are my requirements. Uh, but this of course allows us to plug in all the knowns uh, and the different variables so that we can then get to a point where we can make our own decision. I think that's so correct right there, Justin. What you said is this is going to give us the, the numbers, and then it's up to us as the investors to see how we feel about those numbers, right? So let's definitely talk more about that when we get into the results. 
Now let's say this property, uh, again, ARV, 265,000, it's a single unit. Um, I would say a $265,000 home, that's probably two bed, two bath, maybe rents for, I don't know, 1650 a month. Now, depending on where you're at, uh, if you're here in Denver, you might say, wow, it's maybe a little more. Uh, if you're in some places like Minnesota or elsewhere, it might be a little bit less. Again, you can plug that number in for whatever your personal preferences are. Now we have um, slots here for additional units. Let's just say I'm also going to rent out uh, the basement for $1,000 a month. Whoops, we didn't select a two unit, um, so this rent's not going to be calculated. All right, but if we check it, change it to a two unit, then that rent will be included. All right, so that's one of the steps that's important is to if you've got multiple units, make sure you're selecting those units properly. Uh, but in this case, we only have uh, you know 1,650 for our one unit. Now, vacancy. Right now in Denver, vacancy is historically low. We're right about 3%. Um, I, I, actually, that, that vacancy is up. We were down close to 1% um, about two years ago. But 3% is still really, really low. Average in Denver for the last 40 years has been roughly 5 to 7%. So I like to use 6% just as an average. And I understand it might be higher or lower at any given time. Um, but that's something that you're going to want to factor in there. Next are going to be your annual expenses. The first thing you're always going to have are going to be property taxes. On a $265,000 home in Denver, you're probably going to be about $1,300 a month. Uh, pardon me, $1,300 a year. These are annual expenses. Uh, property insurance. This has actually been going up in Denver. We've seen a lot of hailstorms and whatnot. I'd guess about $1,000 a year. Uh, property management. Do you manage the property yourself or do you have a manager? Um, in this case, I've got a note here, uh, or I'm sorry, we've got the, the note here that the default is 10%. Um, but if you're managing the property yourself, you can put in zero. And then we're just going to put a note here, self-managed property. Okay. Now, repairs and maintenance. Um, I like to factor 5% of our monthly income as uh, our annual, or part, pardon me, our monthly repair budget. So 5% of your income times 12 months, this is going to come up to $990. Now this might be more or less. If you have a home that was built in the late 1800s, you might put $20,000 into it and you still might have to put $1,000 a month into it. I have a home that was built in 2007. It's got a brand new furnace, brand new uh, water heater, doesn't need a whole lot probably can get away with lower repairs and maintenance. So again, this is something that you can plug in individually. Now utilities. Um, if you pay any portion of the utilities, you're going to want to put those in here. For single family residents and condos, generally it's common that the um, tenant pays the utilities, but if it's a multi-unit, oftentimes the owner might be paying the utilities. In this case, we're going to say no, um, that the tenant is paying the utilities. And if it's a condo, you're going to want to plug in your HOA dues. Or sometimes you might have a single family home. Uh, for example, Highlands Ranch has quarterly HOAs. I think it's the community, it's like the community pool and trash service, and it's maybe $120 um, uh, per quarter. So that's something you might want to put in here um, and then make a note, uh, you know, community HOA, uh, 120, oops, 120 per quarter. Okay. If you have that. If not, of course, leave it blank. Any other expenses that you might have? Let's just say you have uh, snow removal. Again, this probably doesn't apply for a single family home, but if I have a, a duplex or fourplex, you know, maybe I have to build that in. Um, let's just say $1,000 a year. All right, we're just estimating that. Who knows? And then down at the bottom, you know, we have all of our information, Pine, Your Castle, uh, Castle and Cook Mortgage. But now we've filled out everything, um, and it's taken us just a few minutes. Once you practice this a few times, you should be able to fill this sheet out uh, really in less than five minutes per property. And what we're going to do, I guess before I, before I move on, Justin, any questions there in the question box as we've gone through this section? Uh, yeah, actually. So there's one. Now, this is more in uh, qualifying. Uh, but somebody asks, they say, I'm a new realtor. I don't have W-2 earnings. Will the after repair equity help me qualify to refinance? Uh, so the after repair equity is important, but we still need to see that you have the ability to make the payments. So we're going to need to see your income from your tax returns or any other sources of income uh, in order to make sure that you can pay the debt on this property, plus all of your other debts. So if you're brand new as a realtor, that real estate income um, probably hasn't started to take off yet. 
but maybe you have a spouse that has some income that we could verify, uh, or maybe you have a co-signer. A real popular way that new real estate agents can qualify for loans is to have mom, dad, brother, sister, business partner, somebody be on the loan with them. Um, but if your income truly is you know, very, very low, that would be a problem. But you'd be amazed how many people might be willing to partner with you uh, if you're able to go out and find the deals and, and you know, find good transactions like this. And what about, uh, I mean, if they're buying a rental property, could the cash flow or potential cash flow from this property help them? Yeah, the cash flow from this property absolutely will help you qualify for this. Um, but if you don't have enough income on your own to make your additional payments, like your house payment, vehicle payment, student loan payments, et cetera, um, you still would not be able to qualify just simply uh, only on this property. You'd have to have to have some sort of additional income for your other debts. Got it. Thank you. Yep. All right. Other questions on this as we're inputting everything here? Or are those the only ones? That's it so far. All right, great. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through these tabs here at the bottom and we're going to get some results. So the first thing it's going to tell us, um, hey, what happens if we pay cash for this property? So it's going to break it down for us right here. Let me zoom in because I know sometimes this type is a little bit difficult to see. Can you see my screen okay there, Justin? Yeah, no, that looks great. Great. So purchase price, 200000 Acquisition cost, $2,200. Even if we pay cash for a property, we've got some closing costs. Rehab of twenty five thousand. Our total investment two twenty seven two hundred. Our after repaired value is two hundred and sixty five thousand. We have no mortgage. Our cash flow statement is going to be rent, which is sixteen fifty a month times twelve months. Vacancy of roughly six percent is going to give us our expected annual rental income of eighteen thousand six hundred twelve dollars. And then we've got our annual expenses for taxes, insurance. No property management because we're going to manage this property ourselves. Repairs and maintenance, we've estimated 5%. We could put a note over here if we did it higher or lower. HOA dues, 120 per quarter. Uh, snow removal, if we have that, $1,000 per year estimated. For our total annual expenses of $4,770, that's going to give us our net operating income of $13,842. Minus our mortgage payments. Uh, oh, that's right. We don't have any mortgage payments because this is a cash purchase. It's going to give us our cash on cash rate of return, which is 13842 which is our cash return divided into that cash investment of 227 And then our cap rate based on our purchase price and initial investment is 6.1%. And if we were selling this property, our cap rate on somebody that would be purchasing it, they're looking at this as a 5.2 cap because this is the new after repaired value and this is the cap, uh, the, I'm sorry, the cash flow uh, on the property. So this is a good metric to compare uh, cash on cash. This is the amount of cash I've got coming in based on the cash I put out, which is going to be the same as your cap rate when you pay cash for the property. But let's look at the next scenario. Let's say we're going to finance this property. So same thing. We're going to get our $200,000 purchase price. We're going to put uh, $50,000 down and get a $150,000 mortgage. Plus, we have acquisition costs, closing costs for our loan, $25,000 in rehab. It's going to cost us $78,690 to buy and renovate this property out of our pocket. But we're going to have $115,000 of equity, so pretty, pretty solid equity there. Our rent doesn't change. Vacancy doesn't change. Our expenses, this doesn't change. But now we've got a mortgage payment. So 150,000 at five and a quarter is $828 per month. That gives me annual cash flow of $3,900 per year or roughly a 5% cash on cash return. And the, the formula is over here, 3,902 divided into my investment of 78,690 equals 5%. Cap rate hasn't changed because the cap rate is independent of financing. So that cap rate hasn't changed. And then if we sell the property, it'd be a cap rate uh, of roughly 5.2 to that purchaser buying the property from us. So this is a way that you can analyze if you're selling a turnkey rental, what would that look like? Now let's look at our third scenario. We're going to purchase this property with hard money. Now this is a little more complex, so stick with me here. Hey, Joe, can you go back one second yes. to the finance purchase? Yeah. Uh, so there is a question on the mortgage payments. Does okay. that reflect just purchase and interest? Or I'm sorry, principal and interest? It does. This is only principal and interest, this 82831. However, your taxes and insurance are already noted up here. All right. 
So the reason we do that is because you're gonna have to pay taxes and insurance on the property, whether you get it, pay cash, whether you finance it, or whether you get a hard money loan. Does that make sense? Gotcha, very good. Okay. Um, and then just to maybe go back to the inputs, um, yeah. when you put in the mortgage uh, interest rate, that is specific, right? So it, it doesn't round? So if um, you in, Good question, I don't know. 5.111, it rounds here, or no, there it is. No, it doesn't round. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you can. That is a specific interest rate. Okay. Very good. Yeah. I don't know. Every everything that I do always rounds to an eighth. Like in my head, everything I do rounds up or down to an eighth because that's the way I work. But that's a very good question. Um, so if you do have something at you know five point nine nine percent, that would work. Gotcha. Other questions on that? Good one. No, I think that's where all we've got so far. All right. So let's talk about what if we pay for this property with hard money. So it's a two hundred thousand dollar purchase. $25,000 rehab. I've got my same acquisition costs. My closing costs are a little higher, a little more expensive to get a hard money loan, but my hard money lender is going to lend me more money. So check it out. I've only got $50,000 invested. So it's the first thing we've got to compare across these three is in a cash purchase, it's $227,000 investment. A financing purchase, it's a $78,000 investment. With a hard money purchase, it's only a $50,000 investment. My after repair value is the same, but I've got a little less equity in the property this time because I didn't put as much money down. So less money down equals less equity, but less money down might also be a good thing as we'll see in the bottom. Now, after I complete the renovation, I've got to do a rehab or a refinance on the property. I'm gonna pay off the hard money loan. My company, Castle & Cook Mortgage, is gonna give you a new loan and we're gonna finance in the closing costs. So you're gonna have a new loan amount of $190,044 and zero cash needed for that refinance. Your initial investment is this 50,700, yet for three months, you had to make your payments to Pine Financial. Justin, if I'm getting a hard money loan from you, do I have to make a payment every month? Yes, you do. Okay, what, what if my contractors are taking longer? Do I still have to pay you? Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, yeah, so it's important to make sure that you're building in that payment that you've gotta be making to the hard money lender every single month. So my total investment is this 56,682. My cash flow statement is still the same rent, same expenses, nothing's changed there. But now I've got my monthly mortgage payment. Now it's a bigger mortgage, and a little bit higher interest rate, thus a higher monthly payment. So check it out. My cash on cash return is really low. I'm only making about $893 on this large, still large, but not as much, but still a good sized cash investment. My cap rate's a little lower just because my overall cost of acquisition was a little higher. And if I was selling this as a turnkey rental, uh, the individual that I'm selling it to would be buying at a 5.2 cap rate. So I would say this is a so-so deal, probably not great. Um, certainly not enough equity to make a hard money purchase worthwhile. Um, the last step we can compare though, is we can look at all three of those on one page, purchasing with cash, purchasing with 25% down, and purchasing with hard money and refinancing it to a conventional mortgage. And then we can go down to the bottom and see which one has the better cash on cash return, which one has the better cap rate, which one is the better investment for the end buyer if we're selling the property. Now, let's make some changes to this. Well, before I move on, Justin, any questions on the hard money purchase or the summary page that came up in the question box? Nope, nothing yet. All right, I know this one, this hard money purchase can be the most complex because there's several moving pieces. But let's say now, let's go back to our inputs page and let's say we've got a really smoking deal. This property, originally we had 200,000 purchase price, 25 into it for an ARV of 265. What if I had an ARV of, I don't know, 300,000? What would that do for me? On my cash purchase, my cap rate's still pretty good. My cash on cash return hasn't changed. On my financing purchase, I still have the same amount of money in, but I have more equity now. My cash on cash return hasn't changed. Cap rate hasn't changed. And my hard money purchase though, I now have only put $26,000 into this property, but I'm still not making any money, all right? It's still costing me too much to make any money on this. So again, probably not a good deal. And I can tell you why this isn't a good deal. 
look at the cost of this property versus how much you're renting it out for. All right, the only way you can get a deal like this to work is really with no financing. But what if I could rent this thing out for $22.50 a month? Let's see if that makes an impact. Wow, all of a sudden, I'm putting in $26,000. I'm making $5,600 a year. Now I'm at a 17% cap rate. I'm sorry, 17% cash, cash on cash and an 8.6% cap rate. This now became a much better deal simply because I'm able to get more rent. Now, you can't just change that and say, oh, now all of a sudden this is a great deal. You have to make sure you're able to get $2,200 or $2,300 a month for this property. Um, on a financing purchase, still pretty good on a cash-on-cash -cash rate of return, but not as good as hard money. And this is one place that a lot of people get tripped up. They say, well, I don't want to get a hard money loan because I don't want to pay the points. I don't want to pay the cost. Well, let me point something out. If you pay all of these down payment and rehab costs out of your pocket, yeah, you're going to make more money, but you're not making as big of a percent on your money. If you use Justin's money, you have less than half as much invested, but you're making more than half of what you were if you financed the property. So you can get a better return with lower cash in. Now, it doesn't work on every transaction, but it's definitely something to be aware of because it could make sense. And then we can go to our summary page and see here, hey, I've got 300,000 invested, I'm sorry, 227,000 invested, 78,000 invested, or 32,000 invested. Now, what if I'm a great negotiator? What if I can go in and say, you know what? I'm going to buy this property for one, 80. I can get a I can get a 10% uh, discount on this property. Whoops, not 18,000. That'd be a really good deal. Yeah, Let's say I can exactly. buy this property for 180. Then I can compare, all right, on a cash deal, I'm going to have 207,000 investment. I'm going to make 9.8%. Wow, solid deal. If I finance it, I'm going to make 15% cash on cash. Or if I get a hard money loan, suddenly I'm making 46% cash on cash because I'm making $5,600 a year on only a $12,000 investment. Now, that doesn't work every time. Maybe you have higher rents, maybe you have lower rents, maybe you have a higher or lower purchase price. But the important point about this spreadsheet is to be able to analyze it, and all you have to do is plug in the highlighted information in yellow or the information highlighted in yellow. Some of this stuff isn't going to change much, and then you can go right over here and see, is this a good deal or a bad deal? Do I want to pay for it with hard money? Do I want to just finance it outright? All right, let me give you another example. What if this property doesn't need any rehab? And then maybe it's only worth, uh, let's see, we were paying 200 for it. Maybe I'm just getting a good deal and it's worth 215. Should I do a hard money loan? Probably not. All right, cost me a lot of money in, doesn't get me a super great return. Whereas if I do a regular purchase with 25% down, I actually get a better return in this scenario. All right, so again, you've got to look at it. Does hard money make sense sometimes? Does it make sense to just put 15 or 20 or 25% down and pay the rehab out of your pocket? Yes, sometimes it makes sense to do that. Or does it make sense to just pay cash for the property? That can make sense sometimes as well. It just depends, and that's what this is going to do. This spreadsheet is going to help you identify which of these is going to be the best route for you. Now, Justin, I think you you recently bought a property on Asbury that we're going to talk about, right? I did. I okay. did. Let's run through the numbers on that. Before we do, any additional questions there in the question box? Oh, yeah. No, we've got a lot of questions that came in as we started playing around okay. with those. Yeah. Um, Generally, after completed repairs and getting the property rented, how long would it take before conventional lenders would refinance the property? Oh my gosh, my favorite question. Whoever that is, make sure you flag their email because <laughs> I got to send them an Amazon gift card. So most conventional lenders um, require what's called seasoning. That means that they have to, you have to own the property for a certain period of time before they're going to give you a new loan. And some of those, some of those lenders are going to be a minimum of six months, 12 months. There's even one here in Denver that requires 24 months before they'll give you a new loan. Wow. 
Here at Castle and Cook Mortgage, we have no seasoning. So you could buy this property, renovate it in one month, and we'll give you the loan right away the following month. You renovate it in one day, and we'll give you the loan right away the following month. We don't have any seasoning requirement. That's what's valuable about purchasing that property with hard money is that we can get you in and out of that loan very quickly with very little cash out of your pocket. So terrific question, whoever asked that one. Yeah. Uh, and so, Joe, where do you lend? Are you just in Colorado? Does Joe lend nationwide? Is Castle Cook nationwide? Sure. Great question. So I'm only in Colorado. Um, we have offices in 33 different states. Um, and then I also have uh, an associate uh, who's a close friend of mine. He's actually a regional manager uh, or, um, excuse me, a, a manager for a large regional lender um, based out of Wisconsin, and they lend in all 50 states. So I have resources uh, pretty much all over the country. Um, it might not be me personally helping you, but we can certainly connect you with the right people. Yep, and I do as well. So if you know somebody's not in Denver um, but is looking for something like this uh, or in Colorado because you lend throughout the state, right, Joe? Anywhere. Yep, anywhere in Colorado. Yeah, so definitely reach out to both of us, and we've got connections to help uh, help you line it up, line you up with the right uh, conventional lender for this. Yep. Um, so somebody asks, can we calculate the points? So yeah, so one point is one percent of the loan amount. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's. So I'm just going to change it right here. Go ahead, Justin. Yeah. So I mean, whatever the loan is, let's just say the per. Uh, look at this number, just the purchase price, round numbers. If the loan was two hundred thousand, then one point would be one percent of that, right? So $2,000. So if we have four points, then it would be 4% of that. Yep, absolutely. All right. What other and, questions? And what else we got? Uh, is there a standard cap rate published for major si uh, cities in Colorado, or is there a cap rate we should be shooting for? Ah, another one of my favorites. Um, you know what? The cap rate that you should be shooting for is entirely dependent on your own personal choices. Um, I kind of think of this as like the stock market compared to the bond market. I have some some friends that do financial investments, and some of them do not invest their money unless they're getting at least a 10% return in the stock market. Now, guess what? They're taking a lot of risk because of that. I have other friends that do investments, and they only invest if they're getting at least a 3% return in the bond market. Guess what? They have really low risk. So, both of those people are right because it's right for their own personal preferences. So for you as an individual investor out there, you need to think about what's your risk tolerance and what cap rate are you looking for? And generally, the lower the cap rate, the less risky the property. The higher the cap rate, the more risk the property is. And a lot of people say, what do you mean by risk? Um, one of my favorite examples is Wash Park. If you're not from Denver, Wash Park is a very cosmopolitan area um, near downtown Denver. It actually did not lose any value during the downturn of the recession of 10 years ago. So during that recession, their values sort of flattened out, but they actually never lost value as a, as a community. Um, but if you go out there and buy a rental property, your cap rate might be 1% to 2%, all right? But you know you're probably never going to lose any value in that property. Now, there's some other areas in North Aurora, a little bit more risky. And in the recession of 2008 to 2010, those properties went down 20, 30, 40%. But you could buy over there and maybe get an 8 to 10% cap rate, depending on the area, depending on finding the right property. But guess what? You're going to have a little bit um, more difficult tenants. You're going to have a little bit more difficult property. You're going to have probably an older property. And if there's a recession, that property is potentially going to go down significantly in value. So what cap rate should you be looking for is entirely dependent on your personal um, risk tolerance and your personal investment goals. Yes, I agree. Um, so here's a question, and I think this was what, as we were going through one of the first examples uh, on this, looking at the hard money. Hard money purchase costs more in lost equity than saved in reduced cash investment. Is this typical? Uh, Yes and no. Uh, it depends on just how good of a deal you're getting. Uh, and that, of course, is one of the benefits, I think, of this spreadsheet is it allows you to compare uh, these different types of uh, financing side by side. So you can see, you know, based on the deal I'm looking at and analyzing, does hard money make sense? Yes or no. Does it make sense to pay all cash? Yes or no. Uh, but, you know, maybe on the next deal, you plug it all in, you look at it, oh, this one does make more sense for hard money because of these reasons, things like that. So I, I don't think that's 
typical no. I think it just depends on the deal you're looking at. What do you think, Joe? I agree 100%. And what I tell everybody is don't get married to only doing one type of financing. I would love to do every loan for every client, right? But there are some of my clients, they'll come to me and they'll ask me what I think about a deal. And I'll tell them, you know what? I think you should pay cash for this. It's not the right deal that you want to get a loan from me because you're going to get a better return if you pay cash. Now, they might also bring another deal and they're like, hey, should I do this uh, as a regular conventional loan? And I'm going to look at it and say, no, you know what? You should actually do this as a hard money loan um, because here's the reasons. You know, you're going to be able to put less cash in. You're going to get a better return, et cetera. Um, there's other deals that people will bring to Justin and to me and they'll say, hey, I want to purchase this property with hard money. And we look at it and say, no, you're better off just doing a regular conventional loan or paying cash. Um, so I don't think there's any one answer that you should do it you know, A, B, or C every time. My best investors understand that every transaction is different. Their exit strategy is different in every transaction. I have investors that use all three of these scenarios and they do it depending on which scenario makes sense for which transaction. Yeah, and it's also based on who you are as an investor. What is your cash position? You know, uh, maybe you're not able to pay cash. So then you're only looking potentially on this uh, spreadsheet at the financing or the hard money options. Uh, right. And then depending on it, I mean, we we're talking about a finance purchase, you would need what, $78,000 uh, to do the deal. Well, that may not make uh, be possible. You may only have $50,000. Um, so what are the different scenarios we looked at on hard money? Yeah, maybe it's not as strong of a deal or maybe you don't have as much equity, but if using hard money allows you to get in with only 30,000 out of pocket, well then maybe that would make sense if everything else pencils out and makes sense. So That's right. uh, again, it's not that hard money is the end all be all or should be used on every single deal, but with this uh, tool, the spreadsheet shows is which one might be better for the different deals in different scenarios. Right. Let me give you an example too. Let's just say we have our same property um, and uh, let's say it rents for, oh, you know what else I forgot? We're going to take out this snow removal. It's no, we're going to have <laughs> snow removal. Um, let's say it rents for this twenty two fifty, and let's say, I think we said the ARV was 300000 Oops. And let's just say I can buy this thing for like 165. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there saying, oh yeah, right, Joe, those deals don't exist anymore. <laughs> Let me tell you something, about 50% of the transactions that I do where I work with Justin and his team at Pine Financial, the client ends up putting no money down. The other 50%, they end up putting between three and you know maybe 10% down, um, which is what we've already looked at. But let's look at this scenario. If we had a big equity gain, which these are out there, um, what if you had a 340% cash on cash return? You invested two grand and you got $7,300 a year. Would you rather have that or would you rather invest 70,000 and get an 18% return? Or would you rather pay cash for this property with 192,000 investment and get an 11% return? Now, what I'm saying in this particular scenario, I think 347, 340% return is a lot better and I'm willing to pay hard money closing costs and maybe eat into my equity a little bit and really my only investment is the two or three months of hard money payments. I'm willing to do that. I don't have any problem with that because of the huge return I'm getting. Now, that's not true on every scenario, right? Maybe it's going to cost me, uh, I don't know, $275,000 to buy this property. Not such a good deal to purchase it with hard money. Maybe not even a great deal to purchase it with financing. It just depends. So that's the beauty of this spreadsheet is you can change this around, figure out, hey, if I get into a bidding war, this property is listed at 165, but I've got to pay up to 185. Am I willing to buy this and make 50% of my money? Yeah, I am. All right. So you can quickly make those changes on the spreadsheet and determine what's going to be the best route. And then you can come up with your break point if you're in a bidding war of, hey, you know what? I'm not paying above this particular price. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and so we've been playing around with a lot of hypotheticals. Joe's bouncing around, changing purchase prices and ARVs and stuff. But let's say tomorrow somebody, you know, your agent brings you a deal. Uh, first glance at whatever criteria you have uh, says it's worth getting in the car and going and looking at. You do so. It say, you come up with, yeah, it needs some love. $25,000 will make this thing pretty bomb proof as a rental. Uh, you know, as you're there with your agent, you're talking about it. Yeah, I think the ARV is 300000 
Um, and then you just start going through the rest of the spreadsheet. Okay, well, what, you know, if I'm pre-approved, I should know what interest rate I should pay, how much down I want to have. And you just start plugging in who are you and what scenario are you looking at today? And you plug this all in and then you go to the, uh, the next page or one of the other pages and say, okay, does this hit my other criteria? What cap rates am I shooting for? What cash on cash return am I shooting for? And does it hit it? Yes, great, make that offer. And does it not? Okay, well, can I either offer less or should I just walk away and find the next deal? So sure. I think with Joe bouncing around a lot, you're seeing just how easy it is to fill this thing in uh, and to make it personalized for you and for that deal you're looking at. And that's really the power in this. Um, when you find a deal, it's very quick to input just the yellow fields and, and it spits out, hopefully, well, it does spit out answers. Maybe they're the right answer, maybe they're the wrong right. answer, but it gives you those answers and you can then apply that to your investing criteria and say, okay, should I do it or should I not? Absolutely. I think you're exactly right, Justin. You want to be able to plug this in very quickly and then say, all right, does this make sense? Am I getting in the car? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a couple other questions here. Uh, somebody's asking for a source to determine uh, rents. Like, is there a good website or how do you come up with it? Joe, you've owned a couple of rentals. What do you use? You know what? I use a super technical website called Zillow.com. And everybody laughs when I say that, but they have put millions of dollars into their rent Zestimator. Um, and I find it to be surprisingly accurate. You can plug in 123 Main Street, Denver, Colorado, 80210, and it's going to give you the rent Zestimate. And I find it to be within $50 to $100 almost every single time. Now, there might be some outliers that are more or less. That's what I use. What do you like to use, Justin? Uh, so I have a property manager I use now to manage my property. So I call them uh, and see Great. what they think. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe they're on a call with another uh, landlord or something or, or talking to my tenant trying to collect that rent so they don't answer my call. Uh, so I can jump online. Uh, Zillow does seem to be working pretty well. Uh, Hot Pads might be another website. Um, Rentometer or Rentometer uh, mm -hmm. is a good one. Um, or if you're just testing out the market, you can go to Craigslist. Uh, Craigslist is a super powerful resource. Now you can't just plug in your address and get an answer. You'd have to play around and look for your neighborhood and the bedrooms and bathrooms. Uh, but Craig, Craigslist can be super powerful. Yep. I agree. Um, Joe, do you lend on mobile home parks? I do not lend on mobile home parks. Everything that I do has to be on uh, properly uh, property that is titled as real estate, and I don't do any commercial lending. So mobile home parks uh, would actually be considered to be commercial property. So unfortunately, that's not something I do. I have in the past, though. I did a terrific uh, loan on a mobile home park in uh, Alaska. It was back in 2003, actually. It was a terrific transaction, but not anymore. Interesting. Uh, and so Pine Financial, we have not lent on a mobile home park yet, uh, but I don't think we're 100% opposed to it. So if you have something uh, that sounds like a good deal, we'd love to chat with you and see if we can make uh, heads or tails of it. Um, what are the implications of a property with more than four units? Uh, again, that's going to now become a commercial property. So residential is defined as anything with four units or less five units or more, it becomes a commercial property. So the implication there is you're not going to be able to use this strategy. You know, commercial lenders are going to have completely different requirements and restrictions. Um, most notably, it's going to be seasoning. Many commercial lenders are going to require you to hold the property for 12 to as much as 24 months before they're going to give you a refinance. Uh, a couple of people may have jumped on a little late asking if they will get access to the spreadsheet. Uh, yes, we will email it out to all attendees. Um, and if you're listening to the recorded version, please just email myself or Justin. Uh, I'll put our email up here real quick while we're going through some additional questions. You can email either one of us and we'll email this spreadsheet over to you. I own a property in an LLC. Are these personal or commercial loans? Yeah, these are personal loans. So we would just do a quick claim deed to transfer that property back to your personal name. Uh, and so one of the steps in this is you know, if you're going to be pursuing the hard money, if that's your intent from the beginning, one of the first steps would be to make sure that you're pre-approved, not only with us at Pine as your hard money lender, but also with Joe as your refinance lender to make sure that the plan of buying it, fixing it, putting a tenant in place, and then refinancing it will go smooth. The last thing anybody wants is for you to get into the property, do a rental level rehab instead of a fix and flip level rehab. To put a tenant in there, uh, and then ultimately, you're not able to refinance out of the hard money loan. Now, it doesn't mean you're stuck and you're going to lose a property. Of course, you can list it and sell it. 
but the options of selling a rental grade rehab with a tenant in place are much smaller than having a vacant property or having a property that you knew you weren't going to be able to refinance uh, and so you entered it with a different exit strategy. So certainly something to be uh, thinking about. I agree. Um, right. So along those lines, if you're talking to Joe and you're thinking about buying it in an LLC, Joe will be asking the right questions to make sure it's as easy as just quit claiming the property uh, into your personal name. Um, if there's multiple members in the LLC, then that may complicate some things. We want to make sure we line all this stuff up ahead of time. So we, That's don't, right. we don't have any, uh, any hiccups along the way. Uh, how do you determine vacancy rates for your area? Okay. Vacancy rates for your area. So here in Denver, there's um, a survey put out by uh, the Denver, I want to say it's the Denver Apartment Association. I'm not 100% sure if that's the right acronym, I think it's D-A-R, um, but they provide um, to the city, they provide, it's, it's probably a 40 page report that gives vacancy based on one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, based on single family homes, based on condos, uh, based on you know large apartment complexes. And what I do is I look at um, the overall stats for one to four unit single family and multi-unit properties, condos and townhomes, and we take an average you know, if there's a hundred thousand single families and we take and and you know fifty thousand multi units and twenty five thousand condos, we take a weighted average of all those vacancies, and that's our average vacancy in the market. So wherever you're located, um, you can probably get that stat. If you Google, uh, you know, let's say Minnesota, Minneapolis vacancy rate, the first thing that's going to come up will be you know a pretty solid website that's going to give you that information. So you don't have to do as much research as we do. You certainly can, um, but you kind of want to just have a, a good guesstimate. Yeah, and so I do a lot of networking. I meet a lot of folks. I go to a lot of classes. I teach a lot of classes, and I just ask people. You know, uh, I mean, just like some what we're doing right here. Uh, one of the first things we talked about was what is the vacancy rate as we're working through this formula. So you potentially have these two experts that are uh, in the market actively buying rental property, saying, "Well, this is what I'm using." So, and then of course your follow-up question, "Well, why do you use that?" And then there's your answer. So. Um, yeah, you can certainly do a quick Google search. There's lots of resources online, but then just as you're out and about and doing uh, the networking and trying to find deals and talking to your real estate agents, uh, they probably have a good idea or resources as well to be asking. I agree, agree 100% with that. All right. Uh, so back to the points. Uh, points are calculated on the purchase price, not the hard money loan amount. No, the points should be based on for the hard money. And when you were talking about the hard money loan and what the hard money lender charges in points, uh, one point is 1% of the loan amount. So we are looking in this case at the hard money loan amount and the points would be a percentage of that loan amount. Uh, Justin, do you mind sharing your property manager's name. Uh, so there's a lot of great ones and I interviewed several of them in Denver. Uh, certainly not all of them, uh, but a small handful. Again, folks that I met through networking and stuff and I settled on Atlas Real Estate. Uh, so far, I've been very happy with them. Uh, they've been managing one of my properties for about a year uh, and I just turned another one over and so far so good. Um, so very happy with Atlas so far. Uh, Joe, here's a comment. Uh, you guys are great. Have you ever done sports announcing? <laughs> have I ever done sports announcing? No, but I do have a weekly radio show. Um, I would love it if you guys would tune in. I do a show on uh, AM 1690 KDMT, which is Denver's Money Talk Radio. And uh, myself and my business partner, we swap off weeks. This week is actually going to be my week. So coming up on Saturday the 10th, um, I'm going to have Jackie White from Your Castle Real Estate on. And we're going to be talking about tips and tricks to interview your real estate agent. Make sure you're working with the right agent. Um, so no, I've never done sports announcing, but boy, I Really appreciate that compliment and would love it if you wanted to tune into the radio show. Uh, like I said, myself and my business partner, his name is David Hosterman. He's going to be doing it next weekend, and then I'll be back on uh, the following Saturday, the 24th. So would love it if you guys would tune in, and thank you for the compliment. That was awesome. Well done in uh, flipping that around and plugging your radio show, Joe. Congrats. Hey, that's that was what I good. Do. <laughs> <laughs> what was the uh, what was the station again for folks in Denver? That's and if they got a website, maybe somebody wants to check it out. Uh, uh, yeah, online. it's AM, awesome. AM 1690 KDMT, and there's a streaming link. Uh, it's Denver's Money Talk Radio, AM 1690 KDMT. Perfect. 
All right. Uh, so we've got, well, that takes us right about to time. Um, that is all the questions I think we have. Uh, here's maybe one last one. Joe, do you do portfolio lending? Yes, the majority of our loans are kept in our portfolio. We do sell a small portion of them off, um, but our portfolio uh, is a little over three and a half billion dollars. So yeah, the majority of our loans we do keep in our own portfolio. Gotcha. Very good. Uh, and what time is that radio show? One more time. Uh, it's eleven o'clock on Saturday. Every Saturday, uh, eleven a.m. Perfect. Very good. All right. Well, I think that's the end of our questions. Uh, Joe, was there anything else? Uh, we kind of got sidetracked with a lot of questions, but these are all great questions. So I really appreciate everybody jumping in on that. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to cover before we uh, end the, the webinar? No, the last thing I would say is thank you all for attending. Hope you got some good information out of it. We'll email the spreadsheet out to you. If you're listening to the recorded version, you can email justin at pinefinancialgroup.com or jmassey at castlecookmortgage.com, and we'll be happy to send the spreadsheet over to you as well. And thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for jumping on the call. Uh, and feel free to reach out if there's any other questions. Tomorrow morning you wake up, you had a question, you get the spreadsheet, you're working through it. Any questions, again, feel free and give us a call, shoot us an email. We're all here to help. Uh, of course, we'd love to fund your deals. So as you find some deals, if you want to get pre-approved, both Joe and I would love to work with you on that as well. Thanks Absolutely. for being on the call. And we will see you next month on the Pine Financial webinar. Thank you.